Welcome back to Chapter 4, Section 3, Citric Acid Cycle and Oxidative Phosphorylation. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe the location of the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation in the cell, describe the overall outcome of the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation in terms of the products of each, Describe the relationships of glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation in terms of their inputs and outputs. The citric acid cycle. In eukaryotic cells, the pyruvate molecules produced at the end of glycolysis are transported into mitochondria, which are sites of cellular respiration. If oxygen is available, aerobic respiration will go forward. In mitochondria, pyruvate will be transformed into a two-carbon acetyl group by removing a molecule of carbon dioxide that will be picked up by a carrier compound called coenzyme A, abbreviated as CoA, which is made from vitamin B5. The resulting compound is called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can be used in a variety of ways by the cell, but its major function is to deliver the acetyl group derived from pyruvate to the next pathway in glucose catabolism. Like the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, the citric acid cycle in eukaryotic cells takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria. Unlike glycolysis, the citric acid cycle is a closed loop. The last part of the pathway regenerates the compound used in the first step. The eight steps of the cycle are a series of chemical reactions that produce two carbon dioxide molecules, one ATP molecule, or an equivalent, and reduced forms, NADH and FADH2, of NAD plus and FAD plus, important coenzymes in the cell. Part of this is considered an aerobic pathway, oxygen requiring, because the NADH and FADH2 produced must transfer their electrons to the next pathway in the system, which will use oxygen. If oxygen is not present, this transfer does not occur. Two carbon atoms come into the citric acid cycle from each acetyl group. Two carbon dioxide molecules are released on each turn of the cycle. However, these do not contain the same carbon atoms contributed by the acetyl group on that turn of the pathway. The two acetyl carbon atoms will eventually be released on later turns of the cycle. In this way, all six carbon atoms from the original glucose molecule will be eventually released as carbon dioxide. It takes two turns of the cycle to process the equivalent of one glucose molecule. Each turn of the cycle forms three high-energy NADH molecules and one high-energy FADH2 molecule. These high energy carriers will connect with the last portion of aerobic respiration to produce ATP molecules. One ATP, or an equivalent, is also made in each cycle. Several of the intermediate compounds in the citric acid cycle can be used in synthesizing non-essential amino acids. Therefore, the cycle is both anabolic and catabolic. Oxidative phosphorylation. You have just read about two pathways in glucose catabolism, glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, that generate ATP. Most of the ATP generated during the aerobic catabolism of glucose, however, is not generated directly from these pathways. Rather, it derives from a process that begins with passing electrons through a series of chemical reactions to a final electron acceptor, oxygen. These reactions take place in specialized protein complexes located in the inner membrane of the mitochondria of eukaryotic organisms and on the inner part of the cell membrane of prokaryotic organisms. The energy of the electrons is harvested and used to generate an electrochemical gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. The potential energy of this gradient is used to generate ATP. The entirety of this process is called oxidative phosphorylation. The electron transport chain, pictured here, is the last component of aerobic respiration 
and is the only part of metabolism that uses atmospheric oxygen. Oxygen continuously diffuses into plants for this purpose. In animals, oxygen enters the body through the respiratory system. Electron transport is a series of chemical reactions that resembles a bucket brigade, if any of you know what that is anyway, in that electrons are passed rapidly from one component to the next, to the end point of the chain where oxygen is the final electron acceptor and water is produced. There are four complexes composed of proteins labeled one through four. In this figure, the aggregation of these four complexes together with associated mobile accessory electron carriers is called the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is present in multiple copies in the inner mitochondrial membrane of eukaryotes and in the plasma membrane of prokaryotes. In each transfer of an electron through the electron transport chain, the electron loses energy. But with some transfers, the energy is stored as potential energy by using it to pump hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane into the intermembrane space, creating an electrochemical gradient. Electrons from NADH and FADH2 are passed to protein complexes in the electron transport chain. As they are passed from one complex to another, there are a total of four, the electrons lose energy and some of that energy is used to pump hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. In the fourth protein complex, the electrons are accepted by oxygen, the terminal acceptor. The oxygen with its extra electrons then combines with two hydrogen ions, further enhancing the electrochemical gradient to form water. If there were no oxygen present in the mitochondrion, the electrons could not be removed from the system and the entire electron transport chain would back up and stop. The mitochondria would be unable to generate new ATP in this way and the cell would ultimately die from lack of energy. This is the reason we must breathe to draw in new oxygen. In the electron transport chain, the free energy from the series of reactions just described is used to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane. The uneven distribution of hydrogen ions across the membrane establishes an electrochemical gradient owing to the hydrogen ions positive charge and their higher concentration on one side of the membrane. Hydrogen ions diffuse through the inner membrane through an integral member protein called ATP synthase. Now this is just the cartoon. I'm going to show you a better, much better video of ATP synthase in action. This complex protein acts as a tiny generator turned by the force of the hydrogen ions diffusing through it down their electrochemical gradient from the intermembrane space where there are many mutually repelling hydrogen ions to the matrix where there are few. The turning of the parts of this molecular mechanism regenerates ATP from ADP. This flow of hydrogen ions across the membrane through ATP synthase is called chemiosmosis. All right, let's see if I can get this video to work. Life requires energy. The universal biological... into a proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. These protons drive a rotation of the turbine within ATP synthase, resulting in the synthesis of ATP. Like all generators, ATP synthase consists of two separate motors coupled together. Within the membrane, we have the FO motor, named after the binding of antibiotic oligomycin, and at the top, we have the F1 motor from factor one. The FO motor is a proton-powered motor. It is thought that protons flow through a channel open to just the intermembrane space where they bind to a ring of protein subunits, rotate 360 degrees, and exit through another channel exposed only to the matrix. The net flow of protons driven by the proton motor force provides the energy for the generation of rotation. The torque generated in the FO motor is transferred to the F1 motor by a central stalk or shaft. 
The F1 motor is responsible for generating the ATP by addition of phosphate to ADP. The top of the central stalk acts similarly to a camshaft, so that as it rotates within the F1 motor, it causes conformational changes of the catalytic subunits. The catalytic unit is made of a dimer of subunits, and there are three of these arranged in a ring. Catalysis occurs at the interface between the dimers. If we concentrate on one dimer, we can observe three distinct states. First, ADP and phosphate bind to the catalytic side. The central staff then rotates 120 degrees to rearrange the molecules. Next, the enzyme undergoes a further 120 degree rotation and the ADP and phosphate are fused together to create ATP. The enzyme then rotates again to return to the starting position where ADP is released and ADP and phosphate can be bound for the next cycle of catalysis. One key aspect of this relationship is that catalytic subunits must remain stationary with respect to a rotating central shaft. This task is performed by a scaffold on the outside of the complex referred to as the peripheral stalk. Recent work has shown that what was once thought of as a rigid scaffold is actually dynamic and is able to accommodate the changes necessary for most efficient function. Looking at this machine in its natural environment by electron chromatography of intact mitochondria has shown that ADP synthase dimerizes to shape the mitochondrial inner membrane into their signature crystal shape. This turbocharges ATP synthesis by focusing the proton gradient near ATP synthase. You can, of course, view that full video on YouTube as well. I will try to remember to put the link in the description of this video. Chemiosmosis is used to generate 90% of the ATP made during aerobic glucose catabolism. The result of the reactions is that production of ATP from the energy of the electrons removed from hydrogen atoms. These atoms were originally part of a glucose molecule. At the end of the electron transport system, the electrons are used to reduce an oxygen molecule to oxygen ions. The extra electrons on the oxygen ions attract hydrogen ions, which again are just protons at the end of the day, from the surrounding medium and water is formed. The electron transport chain and the production of ATP through chemiosmosis are collectively called oxidative phosphorylation. ATP yield. The number of ATP molecules generated from the catabolism of glucose varies. For example, the number of hydrogen ions that the electron transport chain complexes can pump through the membrane varies between species. Another source of variance stems from the shuttle of electrons across the mitochondrial membrane. The NADH generated from glycolysis cannot easily enter mitochondria. Thus, electrons are picked up on the inside of the mitochondria by either NAD plus or FAD plus. Fewer ATP molecules are generated when FAD plus acts as a carrier. NAD plus is used as the electron transporter in the liver and FAD plus in the brain, so the ATP yield depends on the tissue being considered. Another factor that affects the yield of ATP molecules generated from glucose is that intermediate compounds in these pathways are used for other purposes. Glucose catabolism is connected with the pathways that build or break down all other biochemical compounds and cells, and the result is somewhat messier than the ideal situation described thus far. For example, sugars other than glucose are fed into the glycolytic pathway for energy extraction. Other molecules that would otherwise be used to harvest energy in glycolysis or the citric acid cycle may be removed to form nucleic acids, amino acids, lipids, or other compounds. Overall, in living systems, these pathways of glucose catabolism extract about 34% of the energy contained in glucose. Careers in Action Mitochondrial Disease Physician what happens when the critical reactions of cellular respiration do not proceed correctly? Mitochondrial diseases are genetic disorders of metabolism. Mitochondrial disorders can arise from mutations in nuclear or mitochondrial DNA 
and they result in the production of less energy than is normal in body cells. Symptoms of mitochondrial diseases can include muscle weakness, lack of coordination, stroke-like episodes, and loss of vision and hearing. Most affected people are diagnosed in childhood, although there are some adult onset diseases. Identifying and treating mitochondrial disorders is a specialized medical field. The educational preparation for this profession requires a college education, followed by medical school with a specialization in medical genetics. Medical geneticists can be board certified by the American Board of Medical Genetics and go on to become associated with professional organizations devoted to the study of mitochondrial disease, such as the Mitochondrial Medicine Society and the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disease. That brings us to the end of Section 3. Tune in again next time for Section 4, Fermentation. The energy of the electrons is harvested and used to generate a the energy of the electrons is harvested and used to generate a electro no I'm going to say an electrochemical gradient the book wants me to say a electrochemical gradient